Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 159, Top 10 LCGs. we like to thank our Patreon backers for helping us bring you an ad-free episode. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Anthony. How are you, my friend? I'm doing quite well. How are you? <laughs> doing good myself. I don't know about you, but I, I feel like there's... A, a, a darker sky outside it seems like there might be an overcast from a, a very 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 large object that seems to be eclipsing everything else in the board game universe have you happened to i don't know trip over it on your way here if by trip you mean run into face first because it's huge <laughs> <laughs> it's the batman kickstarter Woo! um <laughs> this is what happens when you combine the two of the many hobbies of, of board gamers you got the comic book guys you got the board gamers the people who are both are just like twitching on the floor right now <laughs> um <laughs> this thing is a beast an incredible phenomenon and we'll talk more about that on our acquisition disorder but before we get into all that craziness that's going on and kickstarter what's going on with bga we have that our own craziness going on don't we we do we had some madness it is march so of course we have our board game bracket challenge and and that is something we've done now for the last several years and this is the second year we've done a big contest for it which means you guys the listeners can fill out your own bracket and it has two purposes so the first helps us a little bit we are just two of us and rather than using the magic die of fate that we've used in the past to to decide tiebreakers we use your guys's votes so we can tally it up and determine what everybody else thinks and that'll break the ties um, of which there are generally many the other thing it does is it allows you to win free games so <laughs> bearing a little bit there so we're going to choose winners based on the basically how close your bracket is to our final bracket so you're going to complete your bracket we'll run through the um, we use a very cool piece of software that will automatically tell us which one is closest once i fill out the actual final bracket and then you will win a game from the bracket so any game that's in that bracket that is in print available for us to purchase and ship to you and is under 80 dollars. i think i put down msrp and that's just to avoid people asking for like gloomhaven or something <laughs> something ridiculous that would you know it's off the charts yeah so it's an awesome opportunity for everybody to have some fun play you know this bracket that we put together every year this year's theme because we do a different theme every year is components so uh, I think we got cards, cardboard, plastic, and wood. So each of these four regions is going to be one of those four components. And then the final winners are will be the top games from two of those groups. So yeah, definitely hop on over there. Check it out. It's on Facebook, on the Facebook page, or you can visit BoardGamersAnonymous.com. And there's an article up. Both of those have an embed, so you can just fill it out right there. And make sure it shows the thank you message at the end. Um, a couple people have noted that sometimes it doesn't go through. So fill it out, click enter. It should say thank you for your entry. And then make sure to check back on March 12th. And the winner will not be up yet because we will not have finished the episodes, but you'll be able to see uh, the leaderboard and your bracket. Yeah, each and every year, this is a lot of fun for us. And I think it's a lot of fun for everyone listening. And as you said, this year is all about components. So best components innovative interesting dynamic and you know typically sometimes it makes the game so we want to know based upon what components make the game makes your final 16 8 4 and then eventually the victor so anthony i just want to mention i was recently at a board game convention this past weekend it was dreamation 2018 by double exposure over in morristown new jersey and i know you've been there i've been there daniel we've we've had the whole crew there from time to time once again, a lot of fun. I just want to send some thanks out to everyone there and all the great gamers that I got a chance to play games with at the table. And, you know, if, if you really want to check out a great little convention that's really going to focus on playing games and you're available around July, it's probably no better place to go if you're around the New Jersey area than Dexcon 2018. So check out Double Exposure online 
and you get all the details there. So that's everything that's going on with us. And if you want to keep up on everything that's going on with BGA, don't forget to check out our Facebook, Twitter, YouTube channel, BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our guild on Board Game Geek. And please check out iTunes and Stitcher. We would love to have a review from you. And don't forget our Patreon account. We got some extra special episodes coming up, and it's a great way to unlock those. All right, Anthony, let's get on to the question of the week. Okie doke. I asked everybody, what game has the best stand up and shout moment? So whether it's anger, which can happen in any game, I guess, or excitement, which only happens in a select few games, what game makes you stand up and shout and then you remember that and it sticks with you? So we've got a lot of good answers here. Tim mentioned Pandemic Legacy. Joe mentioned Risk Legacy. I think any legacy game in general where your actions or win or loss are going to impact you know the next five six seven eight nine ten games is going to have that kind of tension george mentioned mentions dead of winter so i think anytime someone gets to announce at the end that they've been the traitor and they got everybody ah ha 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 that's a good stand up and yell moment we have dungeon fighter from brian he mentions uh tim mentions long shot uh gotta love horse track betting simulations i think any game that has Uh, betting simulation is probably a good bet (laughs) good bet and then alex mentions the game of thrones board game and this is another kind of game that i feel like would have these kind of moments the stab your stab everybody in the back type of game (laughs) whether it's i'm about to flip this table or haha i got you so yeah i I think there's a lot of great games out there the cooperative games in particular are always going to be good for this because they're going to have those tight final moments yeah i remember playing poker way back when and that always had those kind of pop out moments where it's either all going to work or not going to work. And I think in board gaming, it has to be Defenders of the Realm. Just that co-op moment where everyone's kind of building together and it all comes down to that one roll and you are pushing all your will in that die to kind of show up your way. Win or lose, it's really, really a fantastic moment in gaming. All right, so that's everything for our question of the week. Now on to our acquisition disorders. All righty. So my acquisition disorder this week is based pretty heavily just on the artwork of a game I saw on Kickstarter. Uh, This is Kami-sama from uh, Colossal Games, and the designer is AJ Lambeth. The artist is actually just listed as Gong Studios, so I guess it's a collaborative effort. Uh, And it's a... They have a whole bunch... Like every game on Kickstarter these days, if you look under mechanisms, it's like action points, area control, card drafting, take that, variable player powers. So I'll be honest with you, I don't 100% understand what this game is about, but... (laughs) It is very pretty to look at, and the combination of all these different things, a little bit of light set collection. Um, I don't think the game's particularly heavy based on what I've seen in the videos. It it looks really cool. Drawing from some of those same mythos and uh, the styles that you saw in like Rising Sun, but a lot more cartoony and a little more traditional than some of those hyper-stylized uh, miniatures and cards you saw in that game. But, you know, this is a theme I always enjoy, the... The take on it here is both kind of whimsical, but also classical. So it's not too cartoony. It's not like Avatar cartoony, but it's it's in between. And so some of the card work, you know, some of the regular um, the people that you meet on the cards are a little goofy looking, kind of Takedo-ish. But others are, you know, they, they're they very evocative of these different kami that you're interacting with. And the, the different, it's the theme of nature is very strong in this game. So I think it's already funded. I'm not sure how much longer it is up, but it is, you know, going to be made. So it's definitely a game I'm looking forward to checking out when it is available to play. Yeah, the same for me. I remember seeing this on Kickstarter and I clicked a little button to save this because it was something I was kind of, you know, circling around a little bit. This is from Colossal Games. And as you said, it's beautiful. It's got this really interesting round board. The artwork is traditional but yet highly cartoonishly stylized so eh, it seems pretty interesting and right now if you pick up the base game you can also pick up the two expansions which is not at a bad price it's about 54 dollars plus shipping not too terrible but like you said it's a little bit on the light side so i'm not sure if, if it's worth all that money but uh if you'd like to check this out you have until sunday march 11th so anthony i had a totally different acquisition disorder up here for quite some time And I've already talked about this acquisition disorder, but I I don't know how you can not talk about this. It's the talk (laughs) of the moment. We couldn't even get through the podcast at the very beginning without talking about it. (laughs) I'm talking about Batman Gotham City Chronicles. This is a Kickstarter campaign that will be running until Saturday, March 31st. (sighs) 
<laughs> Looking at this Kickstarter page, first off, they did an outstanding job with the presentation here. The videos are really nice. They have a, a tremendous number of pictures. They got pictures of all the different miniatures. Obviously, these are prototype versions. This is not the final version, so you don't get to see the, I guess, the um, the final definition of what the miniatures will be like. But Monolith Games, who's producing this, is only producing this on Kickstarter. So if you don't pick it up now, maybe they'll reprint it and run a Kickstarter again, but this won't be going to retail. And if you're wondering how this played, hopefully you've gotten a chance to listen to our review of Conan from Monolith because it uses almost an identical system down to the final details. There are some differences with the Batman version here, but basic gameplay stays the same and they're unlocking a ridiculous number of stretch goals and it's all Batman related. And in the end, if you do want everything, and of course you want everything, especially if you're a big Batman fan, you're talking about a pledge around $320, give or take, depending on uh, shipping and whatever else pops up in their stretch goals. I really hope this is the actual all in because I was like, I was like, all right, so no games for three, four months. <laughs> that's fine. And, you know, maybe I could sell it later. That's fine. Um, okay. And then just, you know, check the credit card and. <laughs> please don't add any extra add-ons let this just be it like i like that where they're just like up front you just this is all the stuff it's fine they're not going to pull the simon thing of uh and there's another 50 and here's another 40 haha now it's 300 dollars, and you thought it was 100 um they're just they're very upfront about it so you can just make your choice and it's cool too because it is a game where the system is already out so you don't look at that price and go ah i can't really take the risk you go okay, I need to track down a copy of Conan and play it. And then if I like it, then this is for me, especially if you like the theme. So for me, it was, I mean, the game is a no brainer. Uh, the price is a little tough and I understand people who also find that tough, but it's kind of a no brainer. So yeah, at this point, there is nothing new popping up as far as the stretch goals are concerned. It seems like they show them when they're about to be opened. So as you said, hopefully nothing crazy shows up later and if you do back at the $320 pledge level, and there's only two pledge levels, if you back at the 140 level, you'll get all the stretch goals and you'll get the two base boxes. The 320 gives you the two base boxes, all the expansions, and a dice pack for free, which is a $15 value. Yeah. I find that hilarious when it's $320. <laughs> like, whatever, guys. <laughs> now, how would you characterize this? This is now there's different game modes in here. So it's not just the standard Conan setup. There's also a 1v1, but basically one versus many tacticals miniatures game? Yes. Yeah, it is. Okay. It is your classic 1v many. Uh, we play this. So it's like co op versus one person playing the, the Overlord, quote unquote. But don't let that turn you off if you played like Descent and you were just bored being the Overlord. This version of the Overlord, the, the person who plays the one, is awesome. Like the, the way it works, the way you have you have this tray in front of you and you're programming your different actions and manipulating these different gems and you get to do all this stuff. It's very similar like the others if you've played that where they made the one very fun to play. And so people will fight over it because it's it's not more fun necessarily than playing the heroes, but you're the one and you get to go against everybody else. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of those other one versus many games. I like them full co-op when they bring in like an app or something. But Conan was one of the first times along with the others where I was like, wow. This, this is what this should be. And so um, it keeps it from not getting to the table because everybody will want to do it. Sure. So if you are a Batman fan or if you did love the Conan version of this, this might be something you want to check out. As we said, it'll end on March 31st. Okay, now to our At the Table with BGA. So for our At the Table, I just want to jump back and talk a little bit about our rating system. It's been a little while since we mentioned it. And some people have been asking, so just kind of to give you a little bit of heads up, we rate games either a buy, and that game is definitely worth your time and money and something that you should pick up. The game could also be a play, something you should sit down and play. You might like it for a later purchase, but it's definitely something that's worth your time. Or maybe a game is a dodge. Maybe that game is something that's neither worth your time nor your money. Or the game could be the word, the dreaded burn. This game is neither worth your time, more money, and it's not really worth its existence on this plane of reality. So <laughs> stay away from it at all costs. All right, Anthony. So with those reviews in, why don't you give us your review for your upcoming game? All righty. So I'm, I'm going to talk about two games, but it's kind of a 
two iterations of the same idea. The first is Town Center. This is an album VR game from 2014, but the fourth edition, the newest edition, just got released and shipped out to people. And the basic idea of the game is you have a map and there's a town center uh, and the base map that's nine squares and you're going to be drawing cubes from a bag and each cube represents some type of part of a city so you have the green or the residential blue is the commercial yellow is the industrial uh, red is the office buildings black is either elevators if you stack them up or parking lot if you stretch them out up to you and so you're going to get two cubes on your turn and what you then do is you decide where you're going to put them and how you're going to build it out and the reason this matters is you can't just stack everything up there's a whole bunch of rules green cannot be placed next to another green blue cannot be placed next to another blue to generate power from the blue ones because they're the ones who are going to get you money they need to be adjacent to a yellow the elevator determines how high you can stack your cubes and then throwing a big twist in all that, the adjacency rule is both horizontal, flat, but also vertical. So you're looking at this in three dimensions and you're trying to figure out, um, you know, okay, these blue cubes over here and then they're connected to this and then you're trying to move this around here. And the cool thing that it does too is that if, and this is, this is the hard part to keep track of, but if you have a certain number of office cubes next to your green ones, the then they, they expand, they grow. Uh, and the same thing happens with your commercial buildings. So having certain number of cubes next to another certain kind of cube will cause it to automatically expand, which is cool in its own right, but it's also a way to connect two adjacent groups of these cubes. Everything's kind of, it builds on itself. So if you have a group of one, it's worth one money. If you have a group of two, it's probably worth three money. As it stacks higher, it's worth even more money because you get cash based not only on size but on height and at the end of the game you're going to score points for your green cubes and the size of those various uh, residential areas you've built out so it's fairly simple once you get past all that as you can imagine based on what i described it's an abstract so you are using cubes they do represent certain things but it is very much draw this thing figure out where to put it abstractly determine you know how you're going to do this there's also a couple other you know quirks to the rules you can buy um, the elevator cubes or the industrial cubes between rounds if you really need them they go up in price based on how many you have on your board though so you know manage that carefully but overall i mean i, re I really enjoy this it's a puzzle it's an abstract and it plays solo the new edition has the central park solo board on the flip side so you can flip that over and um i think you can play with up to eight people because you're really just kind of playing alongside each other drawing from a common pool so that's kind of cool too so this one for me is if you can find it i guess <laughs> it's a buy for me i really enjoy it it's a lot of fun i bring it out all the time and it's it's quick and easy to play it comes in this big box for no reason um like all of album yards games if you've played small city it comes in this giant box and there's a little bit of a components in there um this one's kind of the same but it's really a kind of a small game so the other game is and i'll just real quick on this one is card city xl and it's not the same game, but it has kind of the same idea in that you have cards for your residential, your commercial, your office buildings, your industrial, and they kind of have the same rules in terms of adjacency and moving them around. The difference is it's all horizontal, it's all flat on the board, and the space is a lot bigger. So it's not three by three with a few options that expand. It's much larger depending on how many players you have. Also, Card City XL comes with like 300 different ways to play the game. So you have this basic version, sure, but then you can mix in all these different modules and tweak the rules and adjust how you play it. And it gets harder and more interesting as you do that. The base version of that game is not as interesting as Town Center to me because it's two dimensional and it's basically the same idea. But what it does that Town Center cannot do is expand and add new stuff. Town Center is limited by those big blocky components and th that the game is what it is. Maybe there'll be new boards. Maybe you could tweak it a little, but they haven't really done much with it from first to fourth edition, uh, other than kind of upgrading the look and feel. The um, Card City Excel, however, just has a lot of meat on its bones. And I haven't really dug too deep into a lot of these different versions. I've played a couple and there were interesting takes on the game, but nothing that's really more complex on the upper end of that. So I definitely want to do that, but I wanted to mention that here with Town Center, which I've been playing a lot lately because I feel like if you want the diversity and honestly maybe a game that's a little bit easier for people to wrap their heads around because you don't have that third dimension card city excel is a great one too so i definitely consider that one a buy as well and it's probably a little easier to find because that one just shipped out yeah both of these games i'm aware of the card city excel i did back on kickstarter and i have it waiting for me I haven't gotten to the table yet 
but I did play Small City and really did enjoy that. So if there are any elements of that game in these games, I'm really looking forward to it then. Yeah, I mean, VR's a funny guy because some of his games are, I mean, they're all a little abstract. Sure. Um, but there's like different scales of it. These ones are definitely towards the abstract end of the scale. And Town Center is pretty much an abstract game. Card City a little less so with all those different elements to it. But it definitely feels like his games. So if you've liked his other games, I think you'll like these too. All right. So a game that I was able to get to the table recently is called Rise of Nobility by Final Frontier Games. This was a Kickstarter that recently was sent to backers and I got a chance to get to the table. Now, basically in this game, we are looking at, I guess, a, once again, spiritual successor or succeeding game to another Kickstarter game called Cavern Tavern which was all about these interesting characters and this lightweight kind of random game where you're all kind of fighting it out in the tavern. Well, in this game, you are basically in charge of a small plot of land in the city. And on behalf of the queen, you are welcoming all these different races. So it's all these traditional fantasy tropes. So you have halflings, you have elves, you have humans, which always seems a little generic to have in there. But all these different fantasy races are seeking a new place to live and if you do house them on your plot of land you will get the ability to go to this special stone market that will allow you to accomplish goals by fulfilling orders in order to score victory points so of course this is your traditional victory point game but what's different in this game is it's a dice rolling game that you're going to take those dice and then based upon the pip you're going to play it on different places in the city and based on those places, you're going to get resources. And as I said earlier, you'll be able to go to town center to fulfill orders to score victory points. Or you'll be able to take your dice over to the ship. And by placing your die over there, you'll be able to sell some of your resources for money. Now, beyond that basic kind of setup, there is also an opportunity to build workshops at different areas. These workshops are really interesting because not only do they give you victory points right off the bat, they'll also move you up a reputation track, which is really necessary because throughout the game, what you're going to need to do is move up the reputation track, which is going to allow you to use more pips on your dice. So when you roll five dice, it doesn't seem very big, but you know what? You could get five sixes, and then the only way you could possibly be able to use those dice is either by making the most out of modifier tokens or by having your reputation so high that you'll be able to cover as much of those dice as possible. Now, each of those different areas, one, two, three, four, five, six, are gonna give you different rewards based upon the die that you place there. So obviously the higher numbers are best, but you may not be able to use them based upon your reputation. Now, there's also a place on the bottom of the board in which you'll be able to buy workshops and if you do have an apprentice, which is just a little meeple in that area that's giving you resources throughout the game, you'll be able to put that workshop in that specific area where you've been collecting resources, and it will now give that area a special bonus anytime anyone goes there. This is also very good for you because like Lords of Waterdeep, if somebody else goes there, you'll get some sort of, I guess, kickback. Typically, it'll be a coin or a resource, but it'll kind of help you throughout the game. This is, I guess, a light to medium weight game. I, I figure it's it's probably about a 2.5, 2.6 on the weight scale. The artwork is really well done. It's got this kind of interesting cartoonish yet serious look to it. And the board itself and the graphic design is really well done. There's also a flip side of the board. It has this night version to it in which you'll be able to kind of play a, a variant of the base game. Now, the version I played was a Kickstarter deluxe version, so it came with really beautiful wooden tokens with this game for all the different resources and the meeples. I don't think that's essential. You can still play with just regular wooden tokens and it would work just as well, but it just does add a little more to the game. As I said, not essential, but definitely worth checking out. So for Rise of Nobility, I'm gonna give it a play. I did think that it ran a little too long and it was a little too simple to kind of move up your reputation track in order to, to utilize your dice a lot more. So it, it, it fits in that way. Like definitely if you see this at the table, definitely sit down, get a chance to play. I think you'll enjoy this game, especially if it's a deluxe version, just because it looks a little nicer. And if you don't mind the length and you don't mind some of the little bit wonkiness here and there, 
maybe you bump it up to a buy, but it's definitely worth the play. Oh, that's great to hear. I remember seeing this. It looked really pretty. Yeah, I, I remember seeing this as well. And it was it was I'm glad to see that this is definitely an upgraded game from their previous game, which was a little too random. This is just a really nice, solid, light to medium weight euro. All right, so let's get on to our feature review. So for our feature review this week, we're going to talk about the top 10 LCGs, living card games. Now, unless you've been under a rock or you don't prescribe to fantasy flight games, you may not know what an LCG is. A living card game is very similar to a CCG or a collectible card game in which you're getting cards that's going to enhance your deck and typically, it's going to be versus one other person, or it could even be a co-op. But basically, you're buying boxes in order to get cards, to build up your deck, or to play additional scenarios. With an LCG in particular, all the decks are identical. So if you buy a particular pack, and it's pack A, every pack A, no matter who buys it, is going to get the same pack A. So it's not like the CCG, which has random cards in there. So you give up a little bit of that random funness that comes along with it, but you get a little more stability as far as not having to chase down some ultra rare card that only 1% of the population has out there. So LCGs offer a lot of different themes and a lot of different varied gameplay on that really interesting engine. So today we're going to talk about the top 10 LCGs. When we say LCG, we have to keep in mind that that is a trademarked term for Fantasy Flight games. So... Uh, there are some games on this list that are not technically LCGs, but they have kind of the same idea behind them, and that it is a competitive card game that replaces a CCG and has a set card pool, so you're not looking for random draws. There's a lot of games like that. Um, these ones kind of fit that same model. Spoiler alert, we will also talk about a lot of Fantasy Flight games. So, uh, the first game on the list here is uh, another Asmodee printing, um, and that is Summoner Wars. Um, Summoner Wars is it, it's not really uh, along the lines of like the LCGs that FFG puts out. It's it's more like a, honestly, like a miniatures game, um, kind of that model. And you will buy, the base game comes with, you know, a set number of different uh, summoners and their decks. And then you can buy new decks and new summoners. And there's a whole bunch. I forgot how many exactly they, they ended up releasing, 12, 13, 15, something like that. Um, and then they had like an alternate master set with like spins on those different ones. And some of these upgrade packs would have like mercenaries or other cards that you can then mix into your deck. So there was a little bit of deck building if you had some of these extra cards that could be added to them. Um, the basic idea though is that you have your summoner, you have their different guys that come out and then you're going to basically using the cards that you discard move these guys around the board and take actions to attack your foes um it's pretty quick very tactical and uh, a whole lot of fun and it was a game that we played a lot for a pretty uh like a, a good solid year i think um before you know some of the other lcgs and card games um, that we'll be talking about kind of moved up on it but this is a really good one for quick card based miniature style gaming all right, our number nine is Mage Wars Arena and Mage Wars Academy. This is another one of these card games that really allows you to get in the mind of a sorcerer. So in this game, you are going to play one of these mages and you're gonna to put together a deck of spells. Now, unlike other games, Mage Wars does a couple of things differently. First off, you're gonna have all of your cards available to you right at the start. So you basically can put together like a binder of all these different cards. And whenever you need a specific card, you can use that card. It's not like just having a deck of cards and you have to kind of, you know, live or die based upon what the next card happens to be. In addition to that, Mage Wars is also a tactical board game and it utilizes a grid map. So you really do have to think about the spatial elements as well. You just can't randomly just say, I'm attacking my opponent you actually have to be in range and you'll be able to have different obstructions and different minions on the boards. So you're gonna have some plastic on the board as well. This is really a fun and interesting game and definitely a different take on these card games. All right, number eight is the first FFG game on the list. That is Legend of the Five Rings, the card game. Uh, this is actually a really new game, uh, but it's based on a very old game. So Legend of the Five Rings is an IP that goes back uh, a good 20 plus years at, to the original CCG, um, which was very popular for a long time, as well as the RPG, um, which was also very popular for a long time. Um, Fantasy Flight picked up the license for this a couple years ago, and they produced this, the Legend of the Five Rings living card game. 
the the game takes place in Rokugan, which is like a mystical uh, fantasy version of ancient Japan. So you have samurai and mystics and dragons and these divinities. And you're going to take one of your factions and you're going to play against your opponent. The game's a little bit longer than some of the other LCGs on this list. It's more intricate, a, a little more... Um, drawn out in terms of actually managing the action points and and your deck and there's a little bit of secret unit deployment in terms of people don't always know what cards are out there and how they're going to interact with them so it's definitely a much more i'm not gonna say complicated game because i don't think that's necessarily the case but it's a more involved game with a decent weight to it but it's really if you enjoy the legend of the five rings if it's a theme you remember or have um, ever enjoyed uh, or are just looking for something a little bit different than your typical sword and sorcery or sci-fi style lcg then this is definitely one to check out all right our number seven game is star wars the card game now this is another fantasy flight lcg and this is a 1v1 in which one player plays the empire and the other one plays obviously the rebel alliance now basically in this game you are going to play cards back and forth based upon these different decks that you put together in order to set up offenses and defenses but specifically, the end goal here is a little bit different. So the Empire wins if the Death Star dial reaches 12. So it kind of wipes you out. And this increases throughout the game and kind of moves kind of moves the game towards the dark side. So basically what you have here is a timer. Now, if you want to be the Alliance here, you're looking to kind of get your light side objectives out there and holding off the Empire just long enough by destroying three dark side objectives before the Empire wins. Once again, this is just a fantastic game from Fantasy Flight Games. Great artwork here. It really feels like the movies, and yet it didn't need to have all of those kind of screenshots. So our number seven game is Star Wars The Card Game. Alrighty, number six is Ashes, Rise of the Phoenix Born. Uh, this is from Plat Hat Games, another one from Plat Hat. And it is a kind of a, a direct spin-off or take of what magic does you have your mage and they have all the creatures around them that they'll be summoning um, when you build your deck you're going to choose from one of um, several different phoenix borns i think there's six and then a, a few different ones that they've added um, after the fact uh, as expansions and the game plays out a little bit differently than a lot of these other games i mean the basic idea is the same you're going to play cards they attack they recover they cast various spells like all the stuff you'd expect but a few things are a little bit different one, you can choose your first hand, so you're not drawing randomly to start the game. So you can kind of set up your strategy the way you want to. You use dice as resources, so it's a customizable card game with dice. So they're going to be kind of used to, to bring out different spells and creatures and all these different things you're trying to do. And then the gameplay is actually a little bit different. So each turn is going to be a short action. You're not taking, you're not doing all of these different things until you run out of mana or whatever it is you're using to power your different functions. You just do one thing and it goes back and forth. You can play up to four people as well, which works decently well, except of course people can gang up on one another. And it's beautiful. The artwork in this game is beautiful. It's very bright and vibrant, unlike a lot of games in this genre, a little bit darker. So it is a lot of fun, a very unique take on this, and um, one well worth checking out if you're looking for something a little bit different, but not too different. That's uh, Ashes Rise of the Phoenix Born. All right, our number five is Doomtown Reloaded. Now, this is the expandable card game that kind of branched out from its original class collectible card game, Deadlands Doomtown. Now, in this expandable card game, you are going to be utilizing one of four main groups in order to take control of Gomorrah, California. These different outfits represent kind of like the Wild Wild West, but in an alternate universe quasi magical realm so there's going to be the law dogs the sheriffs and his deputies or the sloan gang which is all, all about chaos the morgan cattle company it's all about money or the fourth ring which is all about this mystical circus that's just a little too creepy to uh be a safe place to visit now what's really interesting about this in comparison to several of these other different card games we talked about is not only are you playing cards to attack and defend yourself but there's a wide range of actions that you'll be able to take to control the town. And then when it eventually comes down to a shootout, you are going to be able to play your cards like a poker hand. So you may not want to give up that great card for offense because you might need it later on to resolve a shootout. All right, that's our number five, Doomtown Reloaded. Okay, number four is Lord of the Rings, the card game. Uh, this is the first cooperative game on this list. 
And it is exactly what it sounds like. It is Lord of the Rings with cards. So the, the way the games work is you have different scenarios um, that will, are represented by quests. And each of these quests has multiple cards that you're trying to work your way through. And so they each have a condition you have to meet. In the base game, it starts out with destroy these, de defeat these, rescue this. But as the game develops, because it is a living card game, it's been around for six years now they get very unique and very interesting the different things you have to try to do you're going to have three heroes and those heroes are going to have different types of resources they can generate i think there's four in the game and then you're going to build a deck around those heroes so you can only draw you can only play cards with resources from a matching hero so you can have up to three different types of cards in your deck usually you're gonna have two but sometimes people do three and there are lots and lots of different ways to build this out so you can have different minions you put out heroes and you know allies that help to fight these different enemies you can put attach different weapons and spells and stuff to each of these heroes and the game is an interesting pull and it's not just about combat you're also trying to complete these quests and so you have to commit characters to quests but when you do that they're not available for combat so you're constantly kind of balancing it out and making sure you're able to um, get enough into that quest that you can actually complete it, but not so much that you get hit too hard when the enemy comes at you. Very, very fun game. Lots and lots of content here for people who love Lord of the Rings. It is very, very heavy on deck building, however. So if the deck building component of these card games is not your favorite part, this may not be the right game for you. Uh, there's another one we'll talk about in a minute that might be. But for people who want a cooperative LCG, this is the go-to or has been for a long time. All right, our number three game is a Game of Thrones, the card game. This is yet another game from Fantasy Flight Games, another LCG that brings another aspect into LCGs because this is not a 1v1. This could actually have multiple players in the game. So just like Game of Thrones, it's all about that attack, defense, and intrigue that goes throughout the game in, in which you join alliances, break alliances, and utilize the different roles in order to benefit yourself or to take down other players. It has really beautiful artwork. This was recently reprinted, and the new version's even better than the old version. If you're a huge Game of Thrones fan, this game is absolutely the right way to go. And if you're not, you will still enjoy what is a beautifully, wonderfully mechanical game of Intrigue, Deception, Attacking, and Fantasy Defense. That's our number three game, A Game of Thrones, the card game. Okay, so number two is Arkham Horror, the card game. So this is another cooperative game. And unlike Lord of the Rings, the card game, this one is less focused on the cards and the puzzle of the quest and more focused on the story and the campaign, as you might expect from any Cthulhu Mythos game. It is designed by Nate French, who is the same designer behind Lord of the Rings, uh, along with Matthew Newman. And... There's a lot of Lord of the Rings in it. So it has similar action point allowance. The way you manage your hand and what you're able to do in your turn is kind of similar. But unlike Lord of the Rings, each character has their own unique character. So you can play one player or two player, or if you have two sets, you can play up to four. And everybody has their own character. And that character can kind of grow and develop over time. What makes the game unique, however, is that at the end of any given game, your actions and the final score of the game is going to determine what happens so the rule book and all the different scenario books are going to be like well did you win or did you lose and what happened how much did you win by what what actually happened to your investigators um, during the course of this game and that's going to influence what happens next now it's not a uh, legacy game because none of this is permanent and you can always go back and play it again you're not locked in on anything you could swap out your investigators and try something different as you move along and there are a lot of these different scenarios that you can run through as part of different cycles. But if you're looking for a game that's more narrative driven, more really, really creative, because it takes all the different things learned from Lord of the Rings and all the different cool things you can do with a cooperative system and uses them in a much more streamlined, accessible way. For me, the difference between this and Lord of the Rings is which theme do you like better and which mechanic do you like better? Do you want story or mechanical deck building do you want arkham or do you want lord of the rings hopefully for you you like one combo or the other for me i like one of each so i like the lord of the rings theme a little better and i like the arkham horror mechanics a little bit better so i have both but arkham horror is definitely the better game and uh one of the stronger lcgs released to date all right and now our number one lcg is actually an lcg from fantasy flight 
Android Netrunner. Now, Android Netrunner had its first iteration many, many years ago and then jumped back up on the market in a revised format that really kind of took board gaming by storm. What's really interesting about this version, and there's so much wonderfulness that goes into all of these LCG type games, is they bring something new to the table, but typically whatever they bring, it's that one thing for everyone. What Android Netrunner does that's very, very different is it's an asymmetrical game. So one player will play as the corporation that is trying to score agendas by advancing them throughout the game in order to score enough points to win. But in order to do that, they have to get gain enough time and enough money, and they do so by creating defenses or ice in order to keep out hackers so no one finds out about their corruption and their takeover of the system. Now on the other side, there are the runners, and the runners are trying to spend money and time in order to crack into this system and break through the ice that the corporation has set up, but there's a danger there. If they're not able to navigate the system and get past the security measures, they could actually take damage themselves and lose the game completely. Now, while the game just plays to seven points, there's a real tension throughout the game as far as trying to achieve your objectives before the other player achieves theirs. It's asymmetrical gameplay at its best. It's the top LCG. It's a phenomenon in its own. It's really a not just a living card game, but it's a lifestyle game. That's our number one game, Android Netrunner. All right, so that's everything for us for this week. Until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat at the table.